I taught, uh, we told it up one time, I've taught 7,800 students at South Texas. Uh, yeah. And then the next semester, it was even more. So. <laughs> but, uh, the, uh, okay, so you're in a course about opening statement and closing argument. So I could stand here and tell you how to structure an opening statement. Uh, there are lots of ways to do that. But you don't just sit down the night before trial and structure an opening statement. It all starts very early in the game. It involves focus groups. It involves, it involves thought process that is fine, refined, 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 and will evolve. It involves, first and foremost, the development of a story. You have to have a story. Um, Jerry Spence always says, the lawyer with the best story wins. And the best story doesn't mean that you have the best facts. It means you do the best job of telling your story. And there's no question about that because jurors absolutely, totally resonate to stories. We all resonate to stories. We all were begging, would mommy tell me a story? It started out that way. And we all, uh, we, we, we will talk about stories and how to, how to develop a story, uh, and how to create a story. And I'm going to talk more about what goes into the elements of uh, opening statements and, and summation. And then I'll tell you a couple of places you can, you can get copies of what I'm talking about uh, this evening. So there's absolutely no question. Everybody knows that preparation is the key to um, success in the courtroom. Is the, what's the key to preparation? Key to preparation is one of the most important things I'll say all night long. The absolute key to preparation is attention to detail. Infinite, finite, little bitty, microscopic attention to detail. Percy Foreman may have been the greatest trial lawyer that ever lived. And Percy, when I asked Percy, I had the privilege of, of working with him. And, and when I asked Percy, what, what is the most important thing you do to win these incredible cases. And um, he said, well, when I walk into a courtroom, I know more about the facts of my case and I know more about the law of my case than anybody on the planet, except maybe the guy that did the shooting. But the, he, I mean, he literally, he said, that's it. You have to have absolute, complete attention to detail. Once you get all the detail down, then you pull it together with your story and all that sort of thing. And people used to go over in the same era, uh, Racehorse Haynes was here. We had some of the greatest trial lawyers in the history of the universe in this city right here. It's a great, great, great bar. And many of them are Sa South Texas graduates. And many of the judges that we practiced before were South Texas graduates. I have tried cases before many people that I taught in law school, so I was always very generous with my grades because you know, <laughs> You never know when you're going to be standing in front of them saying, yes, Your Honor, no, Your Honor. So, <clears throat> but absolute attention to detail. Now, how many squares do you see there? You may have seen this before. <clears throat> how many squares do you see there? <clears throat> All right. Most, most people will see 16. Uh, so, but actually, those who dig a little deeper in a case, do more preparation, will see that they're actually 18. Or if you really are serious about it, you'll see they're 22. It depends on how you look at it, but if you really get into the kind of microscopic examination I'm talking about, you see that there are 26. So 26 is a lot of squares there, but that's not all. See, there are actually 28, or is it 30? Or is it 31? Counting this one. So how many squares do you, I mean, see, that's the point. This is why some people look at a case and see $10,000 worth of damages. Another lawyer will pick up exactly the same file. They're, they'll bring me a case that they've said, here's a $10,000 case. And then we'll go into it, and my staff will get into it, and my lawyers, my associates get into it, and we get $100,000 on it. Why? Because we dug deep enough, we found 31 squares. And we found, we've, we just created a lot of it. We created a lot of it, which we'll talk about also. So, that's the point. Understand about your jurors. Always look at things from the perspective of the other side, whoever the other side is, whoever you're trying to persuade. Because put yourself in the position of the jury and think, how is the jury seeing this? And one of the best ways to do that is to have a focus group. But then you, you try it. We are afflicted as trial lawyers 
we have, I think it's a requirement that you have to have tunnel vision. You can only see the absolute perfect parts of your case. You see no flaws. And those guys, there's a term for them at the courthouse. It's called losers. <laughs> because you have to, you got to get so far outside of the box to coin a phrase. Um, so you have to see, you look at it from what's the judge's viewpoint on this. You're presenting, a, you're presenting an argument to a court. You think of it in terms of how's the court looking at this and how's the court viewing my argument, not how am I viewing my argument, how's the court viewing my argument, what's going to be the weaknesses that the court sees, what do I have to shore up? And the same thing, the opposing counsel. If I'm going into negotiation or I'm going into depositions or something with opposing counsel and I've got a position to, to push, I want to know, I think in terms of what's my opposing counsel, what would I do, not just what is he thinking, but how do you do that? You assume his role. You put yourself in the first place, first position, and you think in terms of, okay, I am now my opponent. I'm looking at this. How would I look at this? How would I look at this if I were in his position, if I were the defense lawyer? And <clears throat> we, we, for years, we had a lawyer with us who was a defense lawyer, and he'd, he'd been a defense lawyer for a whole career, and then um, he started thinking about heaven, and he decided he better switch over to the plaintiff's side. <laughs> And so he came to work for us. And so I would put him, uh, we'd have a big case, and I would, his job, go, pre go prepare the defense. You be the defense lawyer. Punch every hole you can think of. And he had been doing it for 30 years, and he was very good at it. Very much a detail guy. You go punch every hole you can punch in my case. And then we'd come in, we'd discuss it. I'd say, hey, you know what? You're right. That's a weakness. What are we going to do about it? How are we going to overcome that weakness? So, but here's, here's what this is all about. You have to understand this. Jurors see the world not as it is, but as they are. Jurors see your case not as it is, but as they are. So how do you find out how they see it? You do focus groups, but that's a whole different lecture. But you do focus groups. By, by doing focus groups, you see how jurors will view your case. So... You know, 2,300 years ago, this guy nailed it. I think this guy's got a real future in the philosophy business. <laughs> he was so right. These are the same principles that we preach today. Aristotle said, maximize your salient points. Well, that seems fairly obvious. But also, minimize your weaknesses. In your opening statement, in your voir dire examination, you talk about your weaknesses first. By, by talking about your weaknesses, you get two things. One is you get you convey to the jury that you're going to be honest with them in your disclosure of facts. You're going to be honest with them in your case presentation. The other way, the other point is, and it's a great one, you get to put your spin on it. If they hear it first from you, you get to put your spin on it. And I, I usually take it one step further and, and say, now the defense is going to say this, and when they do, here's the answer. So I take my weakness, I tell them about it, I tell them uh, how the other side's going to view it, and then I tell them what the response is to how the other side's going to view it. So minimize your weaknesses. Uh, the other thing is, this is a very important one. Refresh the mind of your audience frequently. Now, repetition is the most powerful teaching tool there is. Let me say that again. Repetition, never mind. The, and, and there's a reason for this. Aristotle figured this out 2,300 years ago. Right now, uh, clin uh, right now, the forensic psychologists who are working on their PhDs are coming up with little light bulbs over the head. You know, say, you know what? Repetition is really a powerful tool. Now, what is repetition? Repetition mean, doesn't mean asking the same stupid questions over and over and because you don't like the answer. Repetition doesn't mean repeating the same form of opening statement that you saw somebody else doing. It sounded good. Repetition means your own. It means coming at your case from every view with a central theme. You've got to have a theme. And, the theme, and you may have two themes. You may have three themes. But the theme in your case is at the core of it. The theme is the core of your story. 
So what you do, repetition means that you tell the same story, you repeat the same story, you, re, you repeat the same message from every different viewpoint. Demonstrative evidence, documentary evidence, expert witness, lay testimony, everything is delivering the same message. Okay, that's what repetition means. And then it also means that the manner in which you repeat it and the, man, and the, the manner in which you, and this is probably the thing that a lot of lawyers really, really, good lawyers really, really, really don't understand. You can't Google context. You simply can't Google context. So, and which is why they'll, they'll have powerful points to make. But they'll, here's point one. Did you get that? Here, I'll say it for you. Here's point one. And now here's point two. Well, it, it just, it just, that's not the kind of repetition I'm talking about. Here's the context of here's point one. Here's how it came about. Here's, how, here's the rule that applies to it. Everything, you put the entire context of your theme. And then you repeat it from all those different directions. Now, you also, um, Ray's talking about the paper I wrote some time ago called the, Trilo the Trilogy of Persuasion, which is that you have to have complete coordination between your voir dire examination, the message you deliver on voir dire, your opening statement, and your closing argument. Because these are the three times that you get to directly address the jury. Voir dire, closing, and opening. It's the only time you get to talk to the jury directly. So you want to be sure this is when you deliver your message. Now, we can't, we can't, we used to be able to tell our story on voir dire. And you still can get your message. You, you still can get your theme out. You can't argue your case in, in, on voir dire like we used to. But you can still get your message out and you can introduce your theme on voir dire examination. And then you come back to opening statement. And in the opening statement, <clears throat> you come to delivery of the theme. And you're, you're raising it here in voir dire. Now in opening statements, you're putting a little more, a little more flesh on it. And you're starting to flesh it out. And then you also tell them in opening statement, here's what I'm going to bring. I'm going to bring you evidence that will support this. And you, you will see in the evidence that so-and-so. Now, then you go into the evidence and you flesh it all out. Then you go into the summation and it's the same story you told over here. That gets you a lot of credibility. When you're telling the same story, and this is where you do want to make the same argument because you, you want to be able to come back and say, as I told you on board examination, or as I told you in opening statement, the more often you can, you can remind them that this is what I told you. I did what I said I was going to do. But then that's how you do repetition. Okay? That's, that's what refreshing the memory of your audience frequently means. Now, of course, the other thing in there, the things that have to have complete coherence, your pleadings, okay? Your voir dire examination, your opening statement, your body of evidence, your closing argument, and your final judgment. I mean, those are the things that should all come out. If you do it right and you get all the breaks, those things should all be just alike. That you plead it over here, you tell about it here, you introduce it to them here, you prove it to them here, you remind them about it here, and you persuade them on it, and then you get a judgment that looks just like that. It's just that simple. But that that were true is... There are lots of, lots of traps along the way, but that's the ideal. So with that in mind, when I'm preparing a case, when I'm, when, before I ever do investigation, before I ever get into depositions, certainly before I do depositions, I draft my pleadings first. I may not, may, I may not file them until next year, but I draft my pleadings first. I draft, the, I draft what I want to be the court's charge. That's where you start. Because everything, everything you're doing, what is the target demographic? The target demographic of your message is jury room deliberation in the aspect of each element of the court's charge. So if that's where your case is going to end up, it's going to end up in the court's charge, in the, in the discussion of your court's charge, then you should start at the same place. So we, we would always, and it was very simple, when the greatest, 
the greatest gift this, the state bar ever gave, it, gave us was the pattern jury charges. When I started practicing here, there were no pattern jury charges. You had to go research what's the proper way to ask this question, and, and the opportunity for error was huge. Um, but you start with your, your, your court's charge. What is the jury going to be asked to answer? What are these specific questions? That, and then you start with that, and then you figure, okay, how can I get them to answer those questions in the way I, what, what I need their answers to be, and how can I arrive at that? And then you, you develop from there. The next thing Mr. Aristotle said was, execute the required level of emotion. <clears throat> this is where we fail miserably. Now, emotion is for your closing argument. Emotion is not for your opening statement. It's out of place. It will play into the stereotype of lawyers that you don't want to be tagged with. Emotion, properly done, is probably best reserved for the closing. If you're the plaintiff, it's best reserved for the closing portion of the closing argument. Because at, at that time, you want the emotion to be, okay, there you're through, now go in the jury room and do what I just told you. But you don't want the defense lawyer to have any opportunity to rebut it. And at that point, you can't do so. So limited emotion, but there is a place for emotion. You need emotion because one of the things that we fail to do, <coughs> we don't engage jurors. You probably won't have any trouble with this question. What is the one single word most frequently used by jurors to, represent, to, to describe jury service? What? Boring. Exactly. Boring. In fact, I don't even know what the second choice was. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it is boring. You know why? Our great, one of our greatest opponents in the courtroom in every trial is David Kelly. Because David Kelly wrote Ally McBeal. He wrote Boston Legal. He wrote all these delightful, um, delightful sitcoms about lawyers that made law and trial look like so much fun. He'd stand up and make these 180-second closing arguments, and the jury would just free criminals and bring in multi-million dollar verdicts. Um, and so it, it made law look like fun. Then they get over to the courthouse, and the first thing they meet is the jury shepherd. And the jury shepherd, is they call them that for a reason, because they treat the prospective jurors like sheep. They can't say anything. They can't do anything. They sit here, sit here, don't read, do that. And then you get into the courtroom. They, you finally, finally get into a courtroom. The first time I had the privilege of being called for jury service. And I went over there and I saw how, what jurors go, go through before they come to me on board our examination. I went back and completely rearranged. I rewrote my approach to Vorda examination because I saw that what they were when, in, in the state when they're sitting here in a panel like you are, what they are is starved for information. They don't know. They, nobody tells them anything. They don't know if they've, if they've come there to try to put a guy in jail who chopped up his neighbor's body and threw him in the gulf. Or they don't know if they're there to take a mother, a child away from a mother. They don't know if they're there to award one of those multi-million dollar verdicts. They don't know if they're going to have a neighbor on a DWI. What, they, they have no idea. So this, is, this provides a wonderful opportunity for the lawyers. Um, judges, some judges try to take this away. They should just sit there and keep their mouth shut. Their, ju their job is to judge not to tell stories. That's my jury, not theirs. That's their jury. It's their jury for the law. It's my job to educate them. It's the defense lawyer's job to educate them in, in, in the fashion within the rules. And too many judges, now federal judges can do it. They have the right to do it. They, they can do anything they want to. If they want to, they can stop, your, they can stop and cross-examine your witness in the middle of your, you can be putting on a case and, and a federal judge, you can, you can say, oh, excuse me, witness be excused. I say, no, I got a couple of questions. Next thing you know, the judge can ask a couple of three questions and just completely blows what you're planning on bringing on with your next witness. But at any rate, most judges will not give them a big prep of what your case is about. So when you stand up in front of a jury on voir dire examination, you have a splendid, splendid, splendid opportunity. And that is you have the opportunity to be the first person to tell them why they're here and to tell them what their role is and to tell them why they are relevant and to tell them why they've been sitting down there for three or four hours 
waiting to get here. And so we all love our educators. We really love to be educated. And so you want to start out not being an advocate. You don't want to be up there arguing your case on board our examination. On board our examination, you want to be doing two things, not in this order. You want to be educating the jury so as to you start out with them liking you. You give them valuable information, valuable to them, not valuable for you that they hear it, but valuable to them. And there's a very simple rule of order examination. The lawyer should do about maybe 15% of the talking, and the jurors should do maybe more like 85% of the talking. You should be asking questions. Now, you can formulate, you can, you, can, you can put your message, you can deliver your message in the question. You can deliver the message in the how do you feel about and that kind of question. So you get your questions out, but you don't stand there and give a long spiel and do an argument and be persuasive and then say, okay, now, how do you feel about that? I just told you how I feel about it. How do you feel about it? You don't find out anything. You find out nothing but like that. I'll tell you one more thing. I'm not going to spend much time on Vordire, but let me tell you this about Vordire. The most valuable thing you can possibly have on Vordire is to convince the court to let you do a supplemental jury questionnaire. We've been selling that to Texas judges for years. If you can get the court to let you give a jury a supplemental jury questionnaire, you will get such valuable information you cannot believe it. And the way you do that is you confine it. We talk about this. We've been talking about this at State Bar for the State Bar speeches probably since the, I guess we started doing supplemental questionnaires maybe in the early 90s when the first, brought, first came up with them. And the way you get them is you convince the court that it will shorten the trial. And that's the key to everything. Whatever, whatever you want, it doesn't matter. If you can convince the court it will shorten the trial, you, you'll get it. So you, you have to convince the court because the court, these people have to, they filled out a form already. And a supplemental jury questionnaire, you may have 60 panel members or 45 panel members or whatever. Then you've got to stop. You've got to pass out questionnaires to everybody with, with, the, <coughs> with, with a pencil, and they sit there and they've got to all answer these, answer these questions. Then they've got to gather them up, and then they've got to make copies of them so that the court has a copy and each lawyer has a copy. There may be five, five sets of lawyers. You don't know. So each lawyer has a copy. Well, that's a lot of work. And so the judge would say, no, you know, I'm not going to do that. Say, no, no, judge, we're going to do it. We will, we've got the questionnaires here. We, we've got them on a hardback. We've got all the pencils. We've got three paralegals right here who are going to gather these up. They're going to take them downstairs. They're going to do, we've got somebody standing by a Xerox machine. We're doing all that. All you need to do is give them a break while we do it. So then, on sub, the reason supplemental jury questionnaires, and this is the greatest advance in, in board examination since it started. The reason is because, obviously, it's not, hard, it's not rocket science. Uh, people will write down things in private that they would never, ever say in front of 40 or 50 strangers. Th again, look at things from the viewpoint of the of the juror, the panel member. They come into a courtroom after they've sat for three or four hours and not be able to do anything. They, they're told to get in line. They have to follow. You have to always have to be behind this person, in front of this person. You got to say, everything is controlled. And now um, a lawyer stands up and asks a question about your personal life. Uh, like the, the lawyer, this is true, true story, as opposed to everything else I'm telling you now. But this lawyer actually stood up and said, uh, ma'am, um, this is going to be a very, it's going to be a long trial. Uh, and so I'm, I'm just wondering, are you going to be able to, to make it? This trial could run two months. Are you going to be able to make it? And he said, she said, yeah. I said, sure, of course I am. He said, well, I was just wondering because how far along are you? And she said, what? I'm not pregnant. <laughs> Truth, that actually happened. She said, I'm not pregnant, and I'm also not voting for you. And, and, but see, it's not her. 
You just offended every member of the jury panel by digging into their personal lives. So, and remember, there are two units up there. There's you, well, they're the lawyers, and there's them. And they, they coalesce. They identify with each other. And so when you pick on one juror, you, you may, I've heard lawyers say this, I took this guy apart because I knew I was going to strike him. So I just took, my, I took him apart. That's stupid. Because when you're offending one a juror, you're offending all the jurors. You know, you really are. So you, you, you start, but you start telling your story there. You start, so if you're going to start telling your story there, you pretty much got to know what your story is before you get there, don't you? So the next thing Aristotle said, he talked about logos, competence, pathos, dynamism, and ethos, which is trustworthiness. So there was this big study done that involved 1,500 actual jurors uh, post-trials, and they asked all kinds of questions. And at the end of that 1,500, they ask them why, if, if they like lawyers, and then they ask, why do you, why do you, uh, what do you like about lawyers? What's your favorite thing about lawyers? What's the best thing about the lawyers that you just sat through a trial with? The answers were trustworthiness, competence, dynamism. Look back, same thing Aristotle said 2,300 years ago. So I don't know, why, why aren't we just teaching Aristotle? Why are we fooling with all this other stuff, you know? <laughs> Seriously, that, he nailed it. We do mention it. Yeah. And see the last one? They like people who educate them. So, all right. Trusting, so trusting the lawyer, it is absolutely essential that the jury like you. It's absolutely essential that the jury like your lawyer. A good friend of mine in Austin, uh, what were we, 25 years ago when they tried that three-wheel rollover? good friend of mine who is a great lawyer went to Austin and tried a case involving a, a rollover. And Baxter, who's back there, Baxter, Baxter and I have been together forever, and Baxter was watching the trial. And Baxter said to me, he said, I said, he's got to be doing great. He had great depositions and everything. Great, spent a ton of money. I mean, a ton of money. And I said, how's he doing? He said, oh, he's doing great, but he's going to lose. I said, really, why? And he, and Baxter said, the jury hates his client. Sure enough, great job, jury found zero. They zeroed out the client. So they, it's important that they like you, and it's important that they like your client. So you're going to have clients you don't like yourself, but you've got to make the jury like them. So trusting the lawyer. You fortify, here's what you're playing into. You have, you're looking at a, early in the trial, in your opening and, and in your voir dire, you're, you're faced with tort reform. You're faced with what has been going on now since 1976, which has been the diminishing of the reputation of the trial lawyer. When I was a, when I was a youngster, when I came into this profession, the trial lawyer was a very distinguished, uh, very distinguished member of the community, and I hope I hope this is a mere coincidence, but I started when, it, when I started, it was great. It was highly respected. Now, after I've been doing this for uh, almost 50 years now, not so much. But what happened in the middle was, in 1976, really, they had a meeting uh, with, uh, Ed, sorry, with Aetna Insurance Company. They got together a lot of their major insurance corporations, and they decided these, these verdicts are getting out of control. So what we have to do, we can't attack the poor victims. So we have to start a campaign against trial lawyers. And so they started a campaign against trial lawyers, and it's been going on ever since. They had all sorts of anecdotes, which, which are absolute lies, and we proved them to be lies. But the fact is, they got a big audience. We don't. They got billions of dollars to spend, and we don't. So it, they, they've won the tort reform. They've won the for, tort reform battle in Texas completely, just completely. Uh, you cannot imagine my first five years as a lawyer compared to what you'll face as your first five years as a lawyer. We had a thing called justice. Uh, it, it's hard to find anymore. So what you don't want to do is don't play into that, that image that has been painted of you before you even get here. The image that you're just a greedy trial lawyer trying to make money off an injured party. 
okay? The, if you stand up and start trying to persuade people on board our examination, that's exactly what will be going. Yep, this, here we go. This is exactly what they expect. So you have to be counter to, you have to counter that. So what you start with, and you start on voir dire with your early statements, and then you start on your opening statement, you start out with, with things that are easily, easily ratified, easily supported. You start talking about um, things that you're then going to follow as soon as you get to your evidence. You're going to follow it with hard evidence. Hard evidence are things that they can see, feel, touch. They're there. There's no question they exist. Hard damages or whatever. But you don't want to start with your damages, but you want to start with your hard evidence. So, <clears throat> so that what, what they see is you're telling them that this is the evidence I'm going to bring you. And then you call your first witness and you immediately start bringing that evidence, but not in the form of argument. You start bringing that evidence supported by hard evidence. That's, this is called sequencing. Very important concept. How do you sequence your trial? The order in which you put things is sequencing your trial. So in sequencing your evidence, you sequence your evidence in such a way that you bring in things early. And this, these are liability facts. Don't start out with your damages. Uh, these are liability facts. Because if you, if you start out with damages, it's like in one ear and out the other because the question is, so what? What, what do I care? I mean, so, I mean, why are we listening to this? So you have to prove your liability first. You have to establish your liability first. You see what? You have to show them the rules that the, that the defendant broke. And when you get to that, when you get to the point where they understand what the defendant did wrong and why and what he did, why it violated the standard of care, why it violated the rules, why, why it violated whatever it was, then they see you, you talk about the plaintiff and the plaintiff, you're proving three plaintiff's cases. You're proving the plaintiff as they were before the injury, the life that had, they had before the injury. You're proving the plaintiff as they are today. And you're proving the plaintiff as they will be in the future. And that's particularly true if you're proving a permanent injury. So you've got three sets of, three sets of uh, filters that you have to look through. And that's all about context. It's all, that's what I'm talking about. You can't Google context. So if they want to know how badly this person is hurt now, they need to be able to compare it to something. What were they like before? So you show before, you show now, and then you get doctors to project what they're going to be in the future. So, but that comes after you get down to the hard evidence. The method of teaching is the military method. You tell them what you're going to tell them, that's for dire and opening. Then you tell them, which is your trial, the evidence at trial. And then you tell them what you told them. So it's repetition. It's, it's Aristotle's repetition. Tell them what you're going to tell them. Then you tell them. And then you tell them what you told them. And so you, here, here's the biggest probably single problem that young lawyers have, aside from being absolutely scared to death, which is a wonderful weapon for a, for a trial lawyer. I mean, for a young lawyer. It's a, it's a wonderful weapon. You just get so much empathy from the jury. Um, I had my first trial probably 60 or 70 times. Well, this is my hope first trial, and so I don't hold it against my client <laughs> if I happen to make a mistake. But anyway, so, but what you have to do is don't over-try your case. Don't over-reach, uh, and if over-try your case, means that you're trying the case you wish you had instead of the case you have. If you've got a, you a $25,000 case, don't try a $250,000 case. You lose complete credibility. You lose credibility. You lose trustworthiness. You lose trustworthiness, which is probably the single most important. They didn't prioritize those in terms of the four things that they like about lawyers. They didn't say it's this and this and this. It's all three. But I personally think trial lawyer, I, I personally think Trustworthiness is, is, the, uh, is the most important. You can, you can win a trial without dynamism, okay? But you can't win a trial without trustworthiness. So <coughs> you want to... So a guy named Albert Einstein said, elegance 
is for tailors. Make everything as simple as possible and no simpler. When you have the burden of proof, you absolutely have to simplify your case. That's why you have to think about it ahead of time and you make it as simple as it can possibly be. I tried an extremely complex case against Kodak Corporation. And they had a, they had a, con these fellows who hated lawyers, they really, the young businessmen, they, entrepreneurs, they hated lawyers. So they, they went, uh, they hadn't had a bad experience, they just, they, they were Republicans in Texas, and they hated, so they hated lawyers, it's a requirement. And so they negotiated, they, they built a product which was absolutely competing successfully with, a, with Kodak, where Kodak had 95% of the market, and these guys were beating Kodak. So Kodak said, okay, I'll tell you what we'll do. Why don't you license that to us? License that product to us. We will become your distributors. And so they said, fine. You know, got the biggest dis distribution system in the world for that product. So the guy, one of them, who's president of the company, flies, flies to Rochester, New York, and he, hating lawyers, negotiates a 750-page contract with the Kodak House Council and their staff of lawyers. I'm not kidding you, 750 pages, it was this tall. And he then signed it. <clears throat> and then Kodak took his product and put it on the shelf and it's never been heard from since. Because in the midst of all that, the lawyers at Kodak, I don't know how they overlooked this, but they failed to put in a due diligence paragraph. It says that we will make our best, we will use our best due diligence to market your product. And of course, not being a lawyer, he didn't know to look for that. So he comes to me and he says, he, he went to Jamel first and Jamel said, Jamel was too smart to take the case because he said it's going to be tried in Rochester, New York. Battle is over jurisdiction. Picking your judges is a major part of this whole thing. But so they came to me and I decided to take it on. So it was, it was so incredibly complex. And the hardest part of it was reading the contract. And I went through every line looking for that. Anything that could be construed to be, dreamed to be, a due diligence requirement, there was none. So anyway, we went to trial. And I got, I drew just a lifetime of clean living. I, I managed to get uh, Judge Justice in, in Austin. And we tried that case in Austin. And... The, when they showed up in the Austin Federal Court, they showed up, they had 15 people. 15 people. They had five lawyers at counsel table. They had two people working their, working their equipment. They had the, all the seats in the courtroom room behind them, they were all filled with boxes for exhibits. And in the middle of the, in the, middle of the courtroom, there, was, there were 12 feet of tables put together and they were all filled with computers and wiring of every sort and all kinds of scanners and documents and everything else that they were going to use for exhibits. And they were ready for this thing. I, look, I took one look at that and Richard was with me and, and Richard, was the, Richard was the guy who was the defense lawyer for 30 years and, and I'd had him do the other side of it. And so I, I took one look at that and I told her, I said, Richard, just go on home. I had Steve Hertzberg with me, who was my trial consultant. I told, I told Hertzberg, I said, just go on home. So I said, and then I called, I called Phil, who would refer me to the case. I said, he wanted to come up and watch. I said, just stay in Houston. And I sat down at that council table by myself with five lawyers over there on the other side and 15 people. The 15 people were witnesses, and they were corporate reps. In a lot of federal courts, you have to have all your witnesses there the first day if the court makes you do it. And so... The, my, my theme came to me very simply because there was a long-haired hippie dope fiend on the panel and he stood up and he, he said, Judge, Judge, which you don't do in federal court, but anyway, and the, he said, yes, sir. And he said, how long is this trial going to last? And uh, the judge said, well, I don't know. He said, let's ask the lawyers. Well, thank God he turned to the defense lawyers first. 
And he said, how long is your part of the case going to last? And they said, um, and they conferred, um, and they decided that it was going to be 15 days of their testimony to put on the defense. And the judge even said, 15 days? And so then he said, how about you, Mr. Nations? And I, sitting at the council table all lonely, said, uh, if we finish four Dyer this morning, Your Honor, I can close by 3.30 because I only have, uh, because this is in response to the judge. This is what's called getting your theme out there. This is in response to the judge. You get top opportunities to do it. Because, because, Your Honor, I have a very simple case. I only have to prove A, then B, then C, and I can prove all those. I have the man who negotiated the contract, the man who signed the contract, and the man who executed the contract. It's all one witness. I'll put him on. He should be through. We should, be, we should rest by 3.30. There was an audible sigh in the courtroom. So then a juror asked the judge, well, judge, if... If they're, if they're going to put their case on this afternoon, why is it going to take them 15 days? <laughs> Ju the jury, my cousin, actually asked that question. And they were like, so, but I decided on the spot, I'm going to try this case. As we, and I also had, I always have graphics. If I, was, if I was famous for anything in this business, it was technology and animations. I, I introduced into evidence the first animation ever introduced anywhere in the world introduced an evidence in a trial. It was right here in Houston. So I was always famous for technology and all that sort of thing. Uh, so I, all that went away. I told them, take it home with you. I took a legal pad, a, 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 a pad and a pen. I wrote A, this is my opening statement. I wrote A, then B, then C. I said, we have to prove three things to win this case. It's A, and then I explained to them what A is. We have to prove B, I explained to them what B is. We have to prove C, then I explained to him what C is. And I said, we're going to prove that through, as I mentioned before, one witness who was the president of the company, negotiated the contract, signed the contract, executed the contract. So it's, this is a very simple case. Now, the defense is going to use a standard procedure here, standard tactic, if you will. It's called the octopus defense. Because if an octopus is is attacked, what they do is they squirt black ink into the water and then they extricate themselves in the opposite direction. They get away in the other while, the, while the, their attacker is trying to get the ink out of their eyes. Okay, so that's the octopus defense. Their job, and the reason they have so many of them, is they're all ink squirters. They're going to come in here and they're going to try to keep your they're going to try to keep your view, your focus off of this. A, then B, then C. And all you have to remember, whatever else they say, is A, did the plaintiff prove A, then B, then C. And so then as it, they call their witness, they call their expert witness, and he gave, he, he gave his testimony. And when I got up to cross him, I said, okay, doctor, let's, let's see if we can get some of this ink out of the water. Uh, you know, and so I, I kind of, it's a running, it's what's called a running theme. And so I used it at every opportunity. So then when I got up and the, the, the closing argument could not have been, I tell you this, you guys got to do uh, one thing you got to do. If, if you want success, there's one thing of mine you can follow, a lifetime of clean living. And that's the key to my success. Because when Kodak, with their two technicians, they get up to make their closing, and they had a superior lawyer. I mean, he, I felt sorry for him because he had all these people that insisted being there so they could play lawyer. He was a great lawyer. But when he stood up to make their closing argument, their defense was that the product didn't work. That's why they never marketed it. And we were saying, well, you never asked us how it worked. It obviously works. We outsold you in Jacksonville, Florida, and yada, yada, yada. But uh, the problem was you never bothered to learn how to use it. So this was your technical deficiency. So the guy stands up to make their closing argument and swear to God, their PowerPoint failed. <laughs> their PowerPoint failed. With two technicians, their PowerPoint failed. I just want to stand up and say, you're on the plane for rest. You know, so. But so then when I got up to do the, the closing part, 
closing portion of the, of the closing argument is the fun part. That's the nice thing about being on the plaintiff's side. Or it doesn't matter if it's the plaintiff's. It's the side that has the burden of proof. Because when I stood up, I said, not since the Exxon Valdez has there been so much oil squirted in such pure, clean water. And the jury laughed. When the jury laughs, you know they're with you. If, they, if you do that and they don't laugh, you, you settle. But, and they cracked up. And from then on, I could say most anything because I knew I had them. And so the, you go from, that's, that's Einstein's concept. Keep everything as simple as possible and no simpler. And I could, I could prove A and I could prove B and I could prove C. And by getting them to focus on that, that this is all I need, all those defenses that they spent all that time. Incidentally, I did a motion in limine on all this testing they wanted to do. So all that equipment, at the end of every day, we had a rehearing on the motion in limine that they could use that testing equipment and do all these splendid tests in front of the jury and demonstrations in front of the jury. So all that equipment sat out there for the whole trial and never used. So, but keep everything, when you have the burden of proof, I said, here it is, A, B, C. They said, no, it's this and this and this and this and this. And, and they, had no, they had no coherent defense because they tried to defend on everything. The defense was simple. Here's the contract. There's nothing in this contract that requires us to use due diligence. That's the simple defense. And if we prove that defense, A, B, C doesn't matter. And they were right, but they never argued that. So think simplicity, opening statements, set out a simple pathway, a simple pathway uh, to victory. And don't overload, don't, don't overtry your case, keep it simple. Liking the lawyers, seriously seek similarities. That means be, people like people who are like ourselves. You go to a bar and you meet, you're introduced to somebody and you, you, you sit down and you talk for a while and you have a beer or whatever and then you leave and say, you know, I really like that guy. We had a lot in common. We had a lot in common. People like people who are like themselves. So you seek the similarities between your jurors and your expert witness, your jurors and yourself, your jurors. We take, we take our jury voir dire. I mean, we take our, the, the, the paperwork that we get from them where they fill out. And this is where the, the questionnaire is so incredibly crucial. And you have things like their hobbies. And all these sort of things listed that don't seem to mean anything. But you couch, I had a case in which the, there was a guy who was a master sergeant in the army, retired, 30 year master sergeant. And he hadn't cracked a smile since third grade. And the guy was just tough as nails. And I, I knew, I knew A, he was gonna be the foreman, and B, the rest of them were gonna go however he went, cause they'd be afraid not to. So I looked in here, we look every night, we refresh our recollection every night. This is important because things the first time you read them don't mean that much. But you go back and read them again, you read their questionnaires or you read their information every night and something that happened today made what you see on here important. So this guy, the thing that he had written on his questionnaire, and, and so I had asked him about it, uh, to give him an opportunity to brag. I said, I understand, uh, I understand your, uh, tell us, what, what was your proudest moment? And he said, when my daughter was born, I said, that's, I think we can all share that. But didn't you have a pretty proud moment in bowling? He said, I certainly did. I bowled 300 in a competition and my 300 was two points over what we needed to win everything. And he was so proud and he liked me. Why? Because I gave him the opportunity to talk about the proudest thing he had. Okay, his proudest accomplishment. So then, when we get down to arguing the case, it's a paraplegic case. If we get down to arguing the case, you come back, this is where you circle back around in, in, in closing and you pick these things up. So we come back in closing and I said, you know, for for us, it is so simple to get up in the morning and go in the kitchen and make a cup of coffee. 
But let's talk about what Floyd has to do to make a cup of coffee. And then we go through the whole thing. He has to, he has to get out, he has to get out of bed, get himself into the wheelchair, roll it into the kitchen, reach up and get the, you know, go through the whole thing. He says, you know, what is so simple for us, for him, is like trying to pick up 710 split. Well, you know, I mean, it just snapped. I was talking his language. Mm-hmm. See, you're talking the language of the jurors. So small things like that, believe me, small things like that are important. You seek similarities. Now, you want to create, you want to create empathy. Never, ever, ever go for sympathy. Sympathy is a mistake. Sympathy will play into the image that they have of trial lawyers. So you want to stay away from that and you want to go for empathy. Empathy means I identify with you. I identify with your loss. I feel for you because I identify with the place you're in in your life right now. Not I feel sorry for you, but I identify with your pain. Hello, a guy named Bill Clinton. What did he say to the African-American community every single time he gave a speech in African care? I feel your pain. But every time... I mean, that was his catchphrase in African community. I feel he's empathizing with them. And they responded nicely. So, but what you do want to project, don't project sympathy. Project courage. And you want to talk about, in opening, you want to talk about your plaintiff. But you want to talk about your plaintiff in terms, you're going to see a very courageous young man here. And we'll bring this, you this in the evidence. Um, courage is not sympathy. Empathy is not sympathy. Plaintiff and... <coughs> The, question, the, the, the real argument is that this plaintiff is doing the best he can with what he has left after what they did to him. So to know what he's doing with what he has left, you go back to what he was before, what he is now, and what his life is going to be in the future. Uh, so that, see, this young man right here, represent this, this youngster, 18 years old, uh, forklift rollover. He was, and that's not a posed picture. I went out and spent a day with him uh, at his house, and we worked out together. And, and he's, he's in working out in the gym. This is a, now, at this, when this was taken, he was a 20-year-old kid, and he's, he's paraplegic. And he said, you know, this kid w- was unstoppable. Paraplegic, paralyzed from the waist down. And he was unstoppable. This is the most courageous. This is, this is probably my favorite plaintiff photo in 50 years of practice because that tells the whole story. This is a kid. This is what courage is all about right here. Here's a young man doing the best he can. Not only that, he, he, he was always popping wheelies in his wheelchair. So he was always tearing up his wheelchair. And he said, you know what I'm going to do? He said, I need some money. You know what I want to do? I want you to get me a bank loan because you cannot get a wheelchair prepared in this town. So I want to open a wheelchair repair shop. I said, Okay. So he opened a wheelchair repair shop. Today, the kid is extremely successful in business. And don't even ask me about this. He's also married and got three kids. So he's totally unstoppable. Um, the, so that's how you want to project him. Now, I'm going to talk to you about communicating with decision makers when we come back. But let me just let me finish up the first part of this with these, these things that you want to, you want to know about. In the opening, there are, there are psychological concepts I'll talk to you about. But in today's world, and especially in your world, the Gen Ys, the, the millennials, okay? I'm giving a speech tomorrow uh, to a group of lawyers on communicating with the millennials. Because communicating with you is nowhere near what you would do to communicate with Ray and myself. Nowhere near it. Because, to give you an example, we're not, we were not raised the same way. When I was a kid, I was in a small town in North Georgia. During the summer, we'd get up, eat breakfast, and leave the house. Small town, 28,000 people. We'd all congregate somewhere. We might run and get a cousin somewhere. There's whoever's on the corner. And we would disappear for the day. And the rule was, we had, when, the, when the street lights came on at night, we had to be home. That was the only rule. We were, can you imagine? There would be Amber report out on you by 11 o'clock. 
So we made our own world. We made our own world. So it, it, when you're talking to me about someone who's independent and making his own world, is wholly different about talking to a Gen Xer or a, Gen, a millennial particularly because you were raised in a, in a world of absolute rules. Like I said, can you imagine you being missing? Can you imagine your kid being missing? Uh, your nine-year-old kid leaves the house at nine in the morning and you don't see him until till the lights come back on in the evening. In fact, we used to knock the street lights out so they wouldn't come back on. And that's, but that's true. And we were all like that. It wasn't me. We were all like that. The whole neighborhood was like that. And we would go up in the mountains. And let me tell you, let me tell you what, the, what those mountains were. You remember Deliverance? <laughs> I'm not kidding you. The Deliverance was filmed in the mountains that we used to play in. And they wouldn't let me come up there because I couldn't play a banjo. But that, the kid with the banjo is my third cousin. No, I'm serious. That, those are the mountains that we played in. And, and nobody, you know, and nobody, and not one of us, not one of us ever got hurt, ever got kidnapped, ever got anything. Um, and we had our own little society at the age of 9 and 10. We used to go over in a highly, completely, totally, 100% segregated community, not city, but state, the state, the whole South. We would go over to our swimming hole and we would meet the African-American kids over there, and we would play games against each other. We'd play baseball against them. We'd play everything against them. We'd, we'd pair up, and sometimes we'd pair up and, and, and play mixed, mixed games against each other. We all swam together. And it just, nobody cared. Nobody cared. And, and that, was, that was in 1947, uh, you know, when it was absolute. It, it was absolute. My father who was a journalist, wrote a story for the newspaper that was entitled, I Saw a Mob Lynch a Negro. And, it, and as a result of which, the Ku Klux Klan came after him. So he sat, on, he sat in the house, he sat in our house, and my grandfather sat on the front porch with a shotgun across his knees. He said, come on. But, I mean, that's, that's what it was like. But we made our own rules. Now, apply that to yourselves. Apply that to the millennials. And here's the point of all this. The point is not that we had a hell of a lot more fun than you did growing up. <laughs> the point is that you are totally accustomed to rules. You live by rules. You live by organization. You live by people telling you what to do. We played baseball it's because we'd get the guy with the ball and the guy with the bat and we'd go over in the field and we'd play. Uh, we'd form, we didn't have any leagues for anything. We just had a bunch of kids that liked to play. And so we played. Now you got Pee Wee League and all these and all these rules and everybody gets a trophy. And I mean, it's just, it, it's a whole different world. So here's why this is important. In opening statement, in opening statement, you bring out the absolute, one of the first things you bring out is the rule the defendant broke. Now, you start with, here's the purpose, there's a rule, and you say it's the defective design of a vehicle or something. There, there's, a, there's a rule that this has to be done in this way. Here's the purpose of the rule. It's, it's so that it will protect you from this and this and this. The next thing is, so you got this rule, here's the purpose. This rule applies to this defendant. This defendant, as you see from the product itself, this defendant, this rule is designed to protect the consumer, people like this plaintiff. It's designed to, to protect the buyer, the buyer who buys it and trusts that it's going to work. And what happened in this case, and the reason we're here, ladies and gentlemen, is because this defendant chose, important word, this defendant chose to ignore this rule. This product failed as a result of which this man's in a wheelchair today. Now, that's not an argument. Those are all statement of facts. Now, you don't just say a rule. We're, you're all visual. You're extremely visual. You're a very visual group. And so you put up the rule in opening statement. You got the permission of the court to do it ahead of time and all that so you don't get interrupted by, by an objection. 
But you put the rule up there. When you're explaining what the purpose of it is, you put it up for them to look at. And then you start it with the purpose of it and his violation of it and so forth. Rules are absolutely crucial. Now, rules don't just mean rules written in books. It, doesn't, it, means, it means rules. It means protocols. It means anything. It may be a group that has its own rules for doing things, but it's done by the entire ind industry. To create a story about a given situation, the ideal way to do it that I found, and it's not my original idea, but is to tell the story when you get all your investigation and you're trying to figure out what really happened. Handwrite, don't type it. Handwrite it so you have to think about it. And tell the story from the first person position. You are the witness standing on the corner. So you don't write the witness on the corner said that he saw the light turn green at so whatever. You, you, you write it as, I was standing on the corner and I was looking here and I saw this and I saw. Now, the ideal way to do that is you go to the corner where that witness was standing and now you tell his story and you can do this into a mic, a tape recorder, but you tell his story. I'm standing on the corner and I look up and I see the car coming in this direction and I look at the light and the light is definitely red, that type of thing. So you tell it from his, it gives you, because then it's important that you're not just saying what, he, you're not just reading a statement from an investigation report. You're seeing what he saw, you're feeling what he felt, you're putting yourself in, the, in that party's position. Then you do that with every person that's involved. And you write a first person narrative from every person's position. And when you, then you pull all those things together. Now, when you start doing your story and opening statement, this is extremely important. Tell your story in the present tense. The reason you tell it in the present tense, it has to do with what Daniel Kahneman, which I'll talk about in a minute, calls, think, calls thinking fast and slow. And what he's talking about is, I've been talking about this for decades, which is the unconscious mind and the conscious mind. The conscious mind is the slow thinking mind. That's the one that has to stop and deliberate about what he just heard or said, whatever. The fast thinking is the unconscious mind. The overwhelming majority of our, all of our thinking is done in the unconscious mind. Here's, the, here's why you tell a story in the present tense. The unconscious mind does not compute in the past tense. The unconscious mind does not compute the future. The unconscious mind only understands the present. So if you want to reach the portion of the mind that where the decision making is taking place, then you tell your story in the present tense. And so when you prepare for that by going out to the scene or going wherever it is, using a product, whatever it is, uh, then you tell it from the present tense of the plaintiff. You go out and look at it from the viewpoint of the defendant. Tell the defendant's story in the present tense for yourself. Now, the thing that made, here's a segue, the, th the thing that made uh, Seinfeld such an incredible hit Go back, and watch, go back and watch the sitcoms in those days that Seinfeld was competing with. The thing Seinfeld did uh, brilliantly was they never spent 15 seconds on one person while that person is. Used to be in the early, you watch the early soap operas. Uh, or you watch the early comedy shows. Watch Lucille Ball, Desi Arnaz. You watch and they'll have the, they'll have the, video on Lucy at all times and then other people will come in and out of her picture. And the mic never, the camera never changes. Watch Seinfeld. Seinfeld, eight seconds. Seinfeld, three seconds. So you got all these characters, you got all these movements and it's always changing because it's fast paced. Okay, that is appealing to the unconscious mind. That is appealing to the, the unconscious mind processes every bit of that. So when you tell your opening statement in the present tense, then, and from the first person, you can also tell it from the first person. You don't have to, but when the time is right, you tell it from the first person. We did a, 
we did a, uh, a seminar at, at Harvard. We do one every year during spring break. It's a five-day program that we created. Actually, I copied the program that we did here. And we do it at Harvard. Uh, and we bring in trial consultants and, and, and all this sort of thing. And it's for, it's for lawyers. And I was there with, my, with a trial consultant. And we were using a, a failure to diagnose uh, a tumor, a breast tumor, and a breast cancer. And that was the story. And the woman, the woman went in. She, the doctor gave her a clean bill of health. She went back in. And when he told her to, when she came back in, he said, too late, you're dead. And sure enough, she was. So we told that we were doing, we were putting people through these paces. Tell the, view, tell the story from the viewpoint of the husband when he first learned of the death. Tell, the viewpoint, tell it from the viewpoint of the doctor who had to explain why he missed the diagnosis when the husband asked him about it. So tell it in his first person. And we go through all these first persons and we have the people that we're teaching go through, okay, now you tell us from the doctor's viewpoint. Give us your first person account of what the doctor did. And then uh, one of my favorite trial consultants I've ever worked with is uh, Peterson says, he turns to me and he said, now there's one more viewpoint that we've missed. Go ahead, Howard, show them what it is. <laughs> they, we've done everybody in the room. What was it? Knowing how he thinks, I went right into it, but I'd never thought of it before. I told the story from the viewpoint of the tumor. I told the story from the viewpoint of the cancer, that the cancer, she goes in and, uh-oh, they're doing a chest x-ray. <laughs> I'm about to be cut out. My time is ending. You know, my job here is over because they're going to discover me and I'm going to be cut out. And then, whew, wow, I can't believe. I can't believe he missed me. And then, okay, now I can finish my job. And then you go through the whole thing from the viewpoint of the tumor. So it's not limited to everybody on the list. Tell the story, whatever works. But think, it, you have, it forces you to think about your case. All right? Now, let's talk about some other things here real quick. Um, I'll go to, we start with generation X and Y. Uh, I want to show you something very quickly. It's called the Culture Code, and there are a couple of books I want to call to your attention. And uh, I would certainly read these and know all there is to know about it. Um, one is called the Culture Code, and uh, this fellow named Clotaire Raphael has, has come into America uh, from France, and he is now. Oh, he is a consultant for half of the top 100 corporations in America. And what does he do? He, he brands things according to, he puts the American brand on whatever they ask him to in terms of how Americans think about something. For example, they ask him, uh, Nestle Company was trying to sell, they were trying to sell coffee in Japan. And couldn't get anywhere with it. Of course, it's all tea over there. So they, they said, you know, that's just a huge market. And if we could get them to drink coffee the way we get, they, they, they drink tea. So they paid him a half million dollar retainer to, to study why do Japanese not like coffee? Why do Americans love coffee? Do you know why we love coffee? If you think about it, it really doesn't taste that good. And before Starbucks, it tasted terrible. <laughs> Coffee does not taste that good. That's why you have to put cream in it. You have to put you have to get all kinds of things in it. That's why Starbucks figured that out. If we put enough crap in it, it'll start to taste good after a while. Well, the reason we like coffee, this is what Raphael filled it figured out, is because of the smell. When we were babes in the crib, we smelled coffee every month, every morning. So that coffee, that coffee smell was branded in our brain. Raphael figured that out. So then he went to Japan and he said, okay, now how do I do that with coffee in Japan? And so they wanted to start Nestle. The corporate idea, of course, was why don't we create, why don't we put caffeine in the candies? So get them to sucking up caffeine. And so anyway, he figured out, he figured out how to get it done with them. And they started with coffee cake and things of that nature that, that sort of gave you the whole coffee feel. And then long story short, 
coffee is a huge seller, and Nestle is the biggest seller of coffee in Japan, and it is a magnificent, a billion dollar success, just because he figured out why we like coffee. Okay, so now what does that have to do with us? You need to read this book at your leisure. This is not the most important book. I'll show you the most important book. But this book is just really interesting. But for example, they brand, he brands people. So what is the American brand for doctor? Anybody? Hero. The doctor's known as a hero. You think that's bad to try to sue a doctor. What's the, what is the, what's the brand for nurse? Oh, I don't know. How about mother? Okay. Here's the good news. What's the brand for a hospital? <laughs> processing plant. <laughs> processing plant. They treat you like a piece of meat going through a processing plant. So if you, how do you use that? Okay, quick example. I've got to get off this. There's a lot to do. I was hired. I, you may not remember, but there was a young girl at Duke University Medical Center about eight, ten years ago now, who, 16 years old, she was a Hispanic immigrant. She came here because she had a bad heart. She went there for a heart transplant. She was given a heart transplant, and when they gave her the transplant, they gave her the wrong heart and lungs. They gave her the wrong blood type. As a result of which, she, she was dying immediately, so they had to go in and do a second transplant, which they took from an alcoholic. They had a picture of this woman. They took the heart. It was, she, was, she was just... She, but she was the only thing available. So they put that heart in her. She still died. Okay. The doctor was, did a complete mea culpa. This is all my fault. And so I, I, the doctor's a great surgeon. It's a great hospital. It's a great surgical team. But I see it on TV. It was on TV every day because she took her a while to die, several days, and they're covering her every day. The first time I see it, the hospital is on there saying, well, you know, it's, there's a thing called captain of the ship, which means the doctor's in charge of everything that goes on in the, yeah. And so I thought, boy, you know, I, I don't know who's going to get that case, but I'd sure like to have it. Here's the hospital throwing the doctor under the bus. Two days go by, and the doctor comes in. The doctor first, his response to that was, well, I don't do the blood typing. I do the knitting. And so they're, they're fighting each other on TV. It was just CNN, but it was still TV, sort of, if, if, <laughs> if you're in an airport. But so I need jurors from airports. So, so the, the, but then three days later, the doctor comes on and does a complete mea culpa. It's all my fault. I'm so, I love that child. I'm so apologetic. I, it's, you know, and just falls on the sword. Because in the meantime, as I found out later on Discovery, they had hired, in the meantime, they had hired a Los Angeles public relations firm who came in and wrote their story for them. And their story was, it's all the doctor's fault. Why? Because doctors are heroes. Hospitals are processing plants. However, when I sued them, I didn't sue the doctor. I found there were 18 different places in the procedure from the time they got the call from Boston that we have a heart available, from the time they got that call until they actually implanted the heart, there were 18 different opportunities for employees to say, wait, those blood types don't match. But it went right through that one. Well, they get at the next gate. Nope. Nobody. No, all the way down to the charge nurse in the, in the room whose specific job it is. It is her specific job to make sure everything is perfect. Went right past her. So what I did was I sued, I sued the hospital for bad training, a failure to implement rules. And my theme was Duke is, is, just, is arrogant. They think that they are so good that the rules don't apply to them. So it was all about rules. We had all kinds of rules. And I pled it that the rules don't apply to them. And I carried it right back to the president of the medical school who was in charge, who was a doctor, who was in charge of the rules. So I named him as a named defendant. And the reason I named him as a named defendant, as president of the college, he was also the guy who had the, who had the authority, the sole authority, to authorize a settlement. So I dropped this right in his lap. 
Now, if you're facing something like, I mean, now I've gone from my defendant being a hero to my defendant being a processing plant who does ignore rules, and they are arrogant. They think the rules don't apply to us. They came back after this, after this was over. Duke came back and issued a big statement in medical journals that Duke is once again leading the field because we've established new protocols. It didn't say because we killed a 16-year-old girl in the process, but we've established new protocols. So anyway, I changed my defendant. That's why this stuff is, they, they came to the table and just beat us to death with money. They, it would have been a hell of a hard case against the doctor. Now, suppose you're, so how do you ever sue a doctor if they're heroes? How do you ever sue a nurse if they're, if they're mother figures? You sue them that that is the code. That's the code. That's the culture code. The code is that the doctor is a hero. This doctor, that's for doctors in general, in the profession. This doctor was off code. So let's look at the code. What does the code call for the doctor to do in this case? The code, which are the protocols, are these. And then you show the protocol. Then you tell the reason for the protocol. You tell who it's designed to protect. And you, then you come to a very important point. This doctor chose, important word, this doctor chose to ignore the protocol. Now, you come back to always state things in the positive. You never say the doctor failed to do this, the driver failed to do this, or the designer didn't do this. Why? Because that's negative and negatives, negatives not only do past and future not resonate in the unconscious mind, neither do negatives. That's an important point, folks. The conscious mind only records positives. So you don't ever say the doctor failed to do this. You say the doctor chose to ignore the rule. So make it a choice because the choice is a positive thing. Now, what you want to do then is you show how many different ways the doctor, how many alternative things were there that could have happened that would have prevented us being here. And then, then the argument goes, you know, let's talk about why we're here, ladies and gentlemen. When, when confronted with these symptoms, you have this choice. You could choose A. This doctor chose to ignore A. If, we, if he had decided on A, we wouldn't be here today, and this child would be alive today. He, he chose B. He could have chosen and go through that. C, D. Instead, he chose to send the child home with an aspirin, call me in the morning. She was dead in the morning. So the more choices you can show that the doctor had, or it doesn't not doctor, the driver had, the engineer had, the designer had, whoever your defendant is, the more choices you can show that they would have had, that they could have made, that would have uh, avoided this tragedy, after a while you get to an exacerbating quality to it all. It starts, they're saying, you know, because you're making them think along with you. Yeah, that choice would have worked. How do I know that? Because that's a, that's a protocol. Here's why, they, here's, here's why they chose the protocol. Here's who it was designed to protect. And yeah, he chose to ignore it. So the more you can stack up. So what you're proving, it, proving is this doctor was off code because code were the protocols, you see. So now what you do then in your opening statement is you set up exactly that. You set up exactly that. You'll see in this case that the doctor had five choices. He could have chosen this. He could have chosen this. He could have chosen this. He could have chosen instead. He chose to send the child home. And that's why we're dealing with the death case today. And so you set it up that way. Rules, choices, 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 choices. Why? Because choices are positive actions. It's not that he just made a mistake. He neglected to do something. He failed to do something. Uh, no, he chose to do the wrong thing. And you always have to couch it that way if you want it to be as powerful. You could say he failed to do it, and it might sell. But it's a lot more powerful to say he chose to do it because then you're communicating with the unconscious mind of your jury. Uh, then, after choices, 
you get to the, the framing of your story. So you, you take all those things that you, all those independent witness accounts and everybody's account, and you, you mold those into your story. And you mold it into the story like Seinfeld. You, you know, the doc, this doctor will tell you this, this, this person will tell you this, this person will tell you this. Now, one thing you never, ever, 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 ever do on for that examination or an opening statement, extremely cautious of this. Never make a promise. Don't promise them you're going to do anything. Never make a promise. And you got to be careful. The judges like you to say, well, the evidence will show, the evidence will show, the evidence will show. First of all, that's not a story. That's just lawyer talk. And it sounds like lawyer talk. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence in this case will show. And the evidence in this case will show. And the evidence in this case will show. That's not a story. And not only that, whether you think you did, you just made a promise to these people that the evidence is going to show that. Now, I got a lot of friends who are lawyers over the last 50 years, and I don't know one of them whose trial ever went on exactly the way they thought it was going to. I've never tried a case where every witness said what I thought they were going to say, every single thing in the case. If it was that clean cut, the case would have settled. Things, mis things happen. That's what makes trial fun. Things happen. You have to think on your feet. So make sure you don't, because why? If you, if you fail to do it, trustworthiness. They don't like you. They don't like you. They don't like your client's case. And they'll take it out on them. Okay? So think in terms of choices. They're very important. The, so look at the Culture Club. Now let me tell you about the other book. This is the most important book I've read in a long time. And mine is, as you can see, it's quite earmarked all the way through it. Ironically enough, I think this is the most important book for trial lawyers today. Um, ironically, it is a book written by a Ph.D. psychologist on economic theory. It's written for economists. And he got the Nobel Prize in economics for this book. And it's still the most valuable book I know of for lawyers. It's, it's Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. Because he covers concepts in thinking fast and slow. He covers all the exact same. Okay, chapter five, choices. The whole thing I just talked to you about. The, uh, and he's got the two systems, unconscious mind, conscious mind, heuristics and biases. He goes through everything we do. Or we he goes through everything we should be doing. Um, and, he, and he does it brilliantly. So that's an important book for you. Um, the, let me see if a couple more things and then we'll look at closing arguments for just a minute. Yeah, let's do this real quick. Give me, give me an example. <clears throat> okay. Mr. Jones was 47 years old, the father of three and a successful banking executive. His wife had been ill at home for several months. On the day of the incident, Mr. Jones left his house, his office at the regular time. He sometimes left early to take care of home chores at his uh, wife's request, but this was not necessary on that day. Mr. Jones did not drive home by his regular route. The day was exceptionally clear, and Mr. Jones told his friends at the office that he would <coughs> drive along the shore to enjoy the view. The accident occurred at a major intersection. The light turned amber as Mr. Jones approached. Witnesses noted that he braked hard to stop at the crossing although he easily could have gone through. His family recognized this as a common occurrence in Mr. Jones' driving. As he began to cross, after the light changed, a light truck charged into the intersection at top speed and landed on Mr. Car Mr. Jones' car from the left. Mr. Jones was killed instantly. It was later ascertained that the truck was driven by a teenage boy who was under the influence of drugs. As commonly happens in this situation, the Jones family and their, law, and their friends often thought and often said, if only, if only, during the days that followed the accident. Okay, so if only what? It, tell me. A million things. Start with Maybe one. If only he had gone home early to do chores that day. Okay, if what else? Only okay, let's tell you one. If only he had taken the regular route. Regular route, what else? If you haven't gone through the light, what else? Mm -hmm. What else? Waited a couple of seconds. After Wait, if only he'd waited a couple of seconds. Okay. 
Okay? Okay, you've made my point. You're a group of lawyers-to-be. Not a single one of you picked out, how about if only the kid hadn't been drunk? How about if only the kid hadn't been speeding? How about if only the kid wasn't under the influence of drugs? How about if he hadn't chosen to run through? You see? Oh, now, why? You're not wrong. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying you're proving my point. The point is an extremely important principle. It's called the availability bias or the availability principle. And the principle is this. We make our decisions, as do jurors, based upon the information that is made available to us. 90% of the information that I made available to you was all about things that Mr. Jones did. So when you started feeding them back, deliberating in the jury room, when you started thinking about them in your own mind, you fed back to me exactly what I fed to you with 90% of what was, eight, yeah, closer to 90% of what was said. Okay, that's my fault, not yours. Now, if you rewrite that same thing, looking at it from the perspective of the teenage boy and what he did and him taking the drugs and him driving the truck and him doing all the things he did, and then he runs into Mr. Jones, then the if only would be, if only he hadn't used drugs, if only he had, and so forth. You see what I mean? So here's the, carry, here's the takeaway from this. You get to make the most important decision in the case, which is how do I use the availability principle? What do I choose to make available? What do I choose to make available to the jurors? And you want to make sure that everything you make available to the jurors supports your theme. It's repetition of your theme. It's coming at your theme from one of those directions we talk about, talked about. So that's why the way you do that is you create your story and you create your themes all having facts that carry your story so that when they get your story, that's what's available to them. Okay, the Kodak case. I made my information available to them. It was simple. It was simple. There wasn't anybody in that courtroom that didn't know what my theme was, A, then B, then C. The Kodak Corporation said, well, how about this, and 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 they just spread all over the board, and it cost them a few million dollars. But it was a really good lesson. They, they have a new guy running their, their uh, PowerPoints now. <laughs> so think about what you're making available. And make available that which supports your theme, that which supports your story, story, that which will support a verdict. Okay? Now, a little bit more. So I call that the spotlight theory. Availability. The jury will focus in deliberation where the spotlight was placed during trial. I could stand here and I could do this with you all day. I guarantee you it works every time. So the spotlight is the availability that you decide to make to them. When you what you focus on increases, and I want to get on through the representational systems. Now, we are commu I'm communicating with you now in three ways. I'm communicating <coughs> with you verbally, I'm communicating with you uh, non-verbally, and I'm communicating with you uh, vocally, okay? Three different ways. The important thing about that is that nonverbal, that, that the verbal communication, the words I'm using, accounts for only 8% of the delivery of my message. That's not to say words are not important. Words are crucial. In fact, I'm working on an article right now entitled Words. It's just the importance of choosing the right word. Um, one of our country philosophers said the difference between uh, the, the right word is the difference between a lightning bug or a lightning, uh, a lightning, a striking lightning or a lightning bug. And it's, it's all the difference in the world, the impact of it. So, but words are important. So, but it is only 8% of the delivery of a message. Vocal communication, which is the tone, the timber, uh, the use of the voice as a weapon, It's also the use of silence. If you got a jury 
if you're making a closing argument and you got a juror that's not listening, you got a juror who's just looking down, you know, thinking about the shopping list, if you just stop talking, you know, that juror will look up and see what's going, what am I missing? It, it, it happens. And then I always put, you put your hands on the rail, and then as the juror looks up, I reach up and go like this, and it brings her right up. She follows my hand right up to my, next thing you know, we got eye contact. Mm -hmm. But I don't charge anything extra for those tips. Uh, <laughs> it's all for the price of admission. Um, okay, so here's the other, the other side of that. Your representational systems, oh, well, I didn't get the most important point. The vocal communication is um, 38%, 37% of the delivery of your message. So what's that leave the rest of it? 55%, if you don't remember anything else I say tonight, 55% of the delivery of your message, 55% of the persuasive process is nonverbal communication. Why? Because nonverbal communication is being processed on a perpetual, ongoing basis in the fast thinking mind, the unconscious mind. It never forgets anything. It, had, it, it doesn't miss anything. It gathers, and so when you get, down to the, you get down to these three things, they're using their auditory system. It's a jury side now. They're looking at their auditory system. They're listening. They're hearing things. They're using their, they're, they're using their visual system. They're seeing things. And more than anything else, you know, third grade school teachers figured this out a long time ago. It's called show and tell. You want to be sure that you put a combination of words and images, words and images, words and images. Your frame should be illustrated by, you should have visual frames. You, your frame should have an image along with it. So they're not just asked to, to remember a word. They remember a frame that, bring, they remember a, a visual that resonates, brings back the frame. And then you, your frame builds your, you build your, your story about that. Um, and then, but the kinesthetic, the kinesthetic, that's the unconscious mind. That's not something where the juror can say to you, um, we do focus groups, and a friend of mine who's a great consultant said to me many years ago, he said, don't ask a juror on focus, don't ask a juror after a trial or don't ask a person on a focus group, why did you vote the way you did? Because they don't know. They really don't know. And, they, and I didn't understand that. And then as I learned more and more about this, I understand it's because the, the kinesthetic, it's, the, it's, it's all this stuff they took in in their unconscious mind that they don't even know is going on. And that's where the decision comes from. So the kinesthetic is the person that gets back in, in the jury room and they say, you know, I heard, I heard the lawyer's argument. It was extremely good. It was very persuasive. But something about that plaintiff's case just doesn't feel right to me. Can't put my finger on it. Well, that's the kinesthetic. That's the gut reaction. I just don't like that case. Maybe something, maybe they don't like the lawyer. Maybe they don't like, and they don't consciously not like the plaintiff. Uh, but they just, they can't put a finger on it. That's your, that's your 55% right there. So the answer to this is then you have to put together a program a story, presentation, shore it up completely with hard evidence. Tell your story truthfully. Don't exaggerate it. Try the case you have, not the case you wish you had. Okay? Try the case you have, not the case you wish you had. That's one of the most important things a young lawyer and a, most of the old lawyers in the world need to figure out. Because if you're exaggerating, if they think you're exaggerating, you're playing right into their image of lawyers, and, which is not good. All right. Now, let me get back real quick to, in the time remaining, I thought about a lot of this. I think probably what I'll do. Okay, I think what I'll do is this. Um, I'll give you a quick sample of a closing argument. This is a vignette. And this is just to show you how to structure. This, this is an emotional part which comes up at the end 
of the uh, at, at the closing part of your closing argument when they can't respond to it. So okay, this is this is a case that happened actually in Austin. <clears throat> so I'm just going to go through it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, to understand why we're here today. Uh, let me take you back to where this all began. It was a Saturday afternoon. It was in August 2006. And Ray and his wife Nancy were doing on that afternoon what a lot of us were doing. They were sitting in front of the television waiting for the A&M Texas game to begin. Okay? And Nancy came in from the kitchen and she said, Ray... I don't have any hot water in the sink, in, in the kitchen. And so Ray did what all of us would do. He said, okay, I'll take care of it during halftime, darling. So they go back, they watch, and she says, no, you go do this now. So Ray goes down, and he reads the instruction on the water heater in the cellar. And the water heater says very clearly, it says, if you hey, smell gas, it says, if you have the odor of gas, turn this valve, and then wait for 30 minutes until the odor is gone. So Ray goes back, he watches the game, and then he comes back during halftime, hour and a half later. And then we see Dave as he goes to the utility room, and he kneels down to read the instructions on the water heater. Dave smells the faint odor of, glass, of gas and finds the pilot light has gone out. The instruction says when the pilot light goes out, wait a few minutes, light it again. Dave follows the instructions carefully, thinking as we all would that the gas shutoff valve on the hot water heater will work the way the manufacturer says it will. We see Dave go back to the utility room where he no longer smells the odor of gas. He strikes a long wooden match on the concrete floor, and we see him as he reaches out to put the flame by the pilot light. We see an instant look of panic on Dave's face as he hears the whooshing sound. He sees the flicker and the flash, and then he, sees, he feels the horrible searing heat. Dave doesn't realize at that point that the pungent odor coming and filling his nostrils, or the burning of his own flesh. We see Ann rush through the garage to the utility room as she hears Dave's screams. Dave is entirely engulfed in flames, and all she sees is an orange ball of fire as she hears the tormented cries of her husband emerging from that fiery ball. Like a lobster thrown into a boiling pot, this gentleman is cooked from his ankles to the top of his head. Not an inch of his skin is spared from the awful blaze. Not his thighs, not his stomach, not his chest, not his eyes, not his ears, which are burned off. We see more than four days, 32 long days and nights dragged by in the hospital. In the burn unit, night and day is measured minute by minute by minute of misery, pain, anguish, despair, hopelessness, until Dave finally reaches the only peace available to him, the peace of death. Sometimes in the quiet and lonely hours of the night, Anne still hears the voice of her husband's screams and awakens in the middle of the night to her own voice of her own screams and her visions of her husband in that fiery ball of flame, all because this, the gas valve on that water heater did not work the way the manufacturer said it would. Okay, you can do that um, in the closing argument, in the closing portion. Now, actually, I would do that in I would, that's what I call a vignette. I would do that in no more than two minutes. It would just click, 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 click. And I would have it memorized and I would go straight through it. Okay, let me give you the one last one. Um, this is a pretty famous closing argument I did. It's published, it's published in uh, 
uh, the summations, Matthew Bender's summations volumes, uh, where they take closing arguments and they have another, an expert analyze them and they break them down. And this is a really good sample because the guy that analyzed it, Larry Smith, did a brilliant job of it. He's just, he was a brilliant, brilliant guy. I can save you the trouble of looking for it in the books. If you want to see the whole argument, it's, uh, uh, it's, this is just the closing portion of the closing argument. Um, and it's in the, it's on my webpage, nations at How, it's uh, howardnations.com, and then you go to publications, and then uh, under publications, you look down and click on death of a child. Oh, as a matter of fact, I think it's printed in the materials. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's printed in the materials. Website. But, but, what, but, the, but you go to the website instead of what's in the materials because the important part of it, the website has the analysis that was done by Larry Smith. He talks about the use of metaphors, the use of analogies, the use of standard arguments. And so that is a, it's a brilliant piece of work that Larry did on it because he was absolutely one of the best. And so th that analysis is what's valuable to you. So... <clears throat> Let me give you a quick little introduction to this. <clears throat> okay. The problem is how do you ask for money in a wrongful death case? Okay. Now we talk of money. We talk of money because there is no magic. Is anyone so callous as to believe that if you, as the jury, had the power to bring young David Taylor back through that courtroom door, that there would still be talk of money? No, you would see nothing but exultant joy as this young couple saw their child rush into their arms and they immediately emerged from the depths of despair into the heights of happiness. As those three people would leave this courtroom as the happiest family on the face of the earth, there would be no talk of money. But ladies and gentlemen, there is no magic. There's only despair. There is no magic. There's only reality. Magic exists only in the world of children. The magic of running faster than the other kids. The magic of David's life <laughs> with his cousins and his uh, snowball, his Alaskan Husky. The magic of just being a seven-year-old kid every day is full of magic. But the magic in young David Taylor's life ended on November 4th, 2006, when the product designed and manufactured by this defendant exploded and took with it the life of this young man and the hopes and dreams and wishes of this young couple. Why? They knew, it was, they knew it was defective. We've shown you that they made a, an outrageous profit-motivated decision not to recall that product. Why? Because a, re a recall would have cost them $4 million. So they left the product on the market and the inevitable tragedy occurred. If it hadn't been David, it would have been some other youngster. So we talk of money now because they talked of money then. So when you're talking about the damages in this case, don't look at the loss. Don't look at the death. But examine closely instead the life that never will be. This young couple will never again share the daily joys, tears, hopes, and fears of young David. His father will never know if he would have followed in his footsteps. High school quarterback. Would he have gone to college? Would he have gotten an academic scholarship? Would he have gone to med school like his father? Would he have been a full-time military retired colonel like his grandfather, we will never know because David's life was a mere preview of coming attractions. But they also lost those special moments that occur as parents watch a child grow up. 
they'll never know the experience of graduation from grammar school, high school, uh, going to college. They'll never know the thrill of watching young David graduate from college. They'll never know, mostly, they'll never know those special moments that parents cherish for a lifetime. When David walks back in one day from college and says, Mom, Dad, this is the woman I'm going to marry. David will never, David Sr. will never get that call of that, congratulations, Grandpa, it's a boy. Karen will never again hear the four most beautiful words in the world. I love you, Mommy. Days of celebration, family celebration in America are now days of mourning in the Taylor household. Birthdays, Christmas, Thanksgiving, any gathering where this fine young man is not there. Instead, they have to look at his cousins who were his same age and just think about their own loss. So when you think about the damage, measure that life that never will be. So that's enough. That goes on forever. So anyway, um, that's where you put the emotion in. Uh, I hope I've said something that's going to help you in your career and help you help your clients. That's the most important thing. So thank you very much.